Hello and welcome back everybody. I, as always, am Dan, and you may be wondering, what exactly is this? Because the title doesn't say Lab Maniacs. And that's correct. This is the first episode of a new podcast that we are debuting called Dual Nature. Joining me is none other than someone none of you have ever heard of before, except for probably a handful of you that played with us at SCG Con and... Uh, well, I guess people that play game theory. But I would like to introduce, for the first time on the Laboratory Maniacs channel, Will. Say hi. Hi, guys. How's it going? That's Will. Will, would you like to tell our dear listeners a little about yourself? Um, I have been playing Magic for about 15 years. Um, I'm a perennial game day second place finalist um i mainly delve into formats uh pretty much all formats so limited constructive uh edh etc i was a pseudo kind of grinder at some point but i'm kind of more as i've gotten older kind of delving into the more multiplayer and kind of casual aspect of life in terms of magic just because Real life things happen, and you have more responsibilities, and you kind of delve into lesser. I can't really go to GPs every weekend. You yeah, know? <laughs> you and BBD found yourself at the same bifurcation in the road, and he took the path of a grinder, and you took the path of a degree. Also, like two hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently yeah. cheeseburgers. But uh, well, it happens. I, I eat guess those too, but not I've as much definitely as he, seen he you eat a lot of cheeseburgers. He probably could. And like. Probably all of us. <laughs> <laughs> but that is irrelevant to our topic today. I want to take a second to just introduce the intent of this podcast. Before I helped start the Lab Maniacs, I was a primarily casual EDH player. Not casual in the sense that I liked to play chair tribal or ladies looking left, that kind of casual, but that I didn't see a need for total optimization. I still played relatively high power decks even as far back as undergrad when we were playing at our LGS fun and games. We all, in that particular meta, had fairly tuned decks for casual players. We're looking at like play EDH mid power level, maybe the 55 to 75 percent range back then. And it took me a second to really be able to transition into competitive EDH because there is a bit of a mental barrier in how you approach what you're doing. Will is coming from a slightly opposite perspective. He has been much more into the tuned casual EDH before branching into competitive relatively recently, you would say. Because of that, we thought we might have a somewhat unique perspective to be able to share in a podcast like this because of the platform we have, which is primarily competitive, but the background we have, which is primarily casual, similar to Cameron, but not necessarily similar to someone like Siggy or Luke, who are much more consistently competitive players. So the goal of the Dual Nature podcast is to try and shed a lot of light on the perspective of both casual and competitive EDH players approaching the same format from vastly different viewpoints and to look at how those differing viewpoints can compare and contrast on a variety of topics. And that sound uh, like something you're okay with, Will? Yeah, it's all good with me. Like I didn't clear this with him before putting him in front of my microphone. Wait, there's a microphone? <laughs> So to start us off today, I want to go with very, very basic questions so that we can get a feel for both Will's ideas on the game as well as mine from less of a, I'm a caricature on the internet playing really high-powered magic cards and being a dick to people so that you can get a sense for us as podcast hosts. It sounds kind of similar to how you are in like day-to-day -day life. I don't want to, that's details. Stop it. <laughs> so question one, and possibly one of the hardest questions that I am going to ask on this podcast, Will, okay. why do you like EDH? So I primarily like EDH because it allows for me personally to play with a lot of cards in which I do not really get to play with outside of the EDH format. 
Like um, Shuko. Yes. Um, so, like, primarily someone who usually plays competitive, constructed events, so, like, standard, modern, legacy, um, and limited events, you have a lot of, you, a lot of the cards don't carry over. So you have a lot of weird kind of ha- uh, mix of old decks, kind of like you can play your Siege Rhinos in Commander, <laughs> you can play, like, ran- like a, l- a bunch of cards that kind of get phased out once their time with the constructed formats are kind of over with or whatever that limited format at that time is done with. And so it's just kind of an, for me personally, like it was kind of a thing where, Hey, I have all these physical cards. I'm a college student. Don't necessarily have all the funding. So I'm like, where can I fund all these cards in without you losing a crap ton of value upon them? If I wanted to sell them out. And so I'm like, how can I get the most out of my cards? And so at that point I was like, Hey, I heard of the commander things heard that um, at this, I've really primarily got into the format whenever the first pre-constructed commander decks came out. There's the ones with like Mimeoplasm. Yeah. That was back in 2011. Yeah. Right? I think it was 2011. That was, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. They did 2011. Then they did, they skipped a year and then mm-hmm. it became like an annual thing. Yeah. I remember I bought the Mimeoplasm deck and that was kind of like my first delve into commander. Cause it was like the big hot news around like my OGS at the time. And I was like, Hey, this is a fun thing that my friends and I can kind of play um, over the kitchen table, or just kind of expanded from there and just kind of has been like a kind of almost like a kind of like love child of mine to some regard throughout my magic career at this point, because like it's kind of something that I've always can kind of go back on. And it's like, hey, standard format, for example, not right now, but in the past, like it's been crappy. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're telling something me something to go back on. Modern is hit and miss, depending on whatever cards get banned or unbanned at the time, or whatever gets printed. And legacy is always legacy, and sometimes it's forgiving or unforgiving, depending on what type of archetype and or deck you play. Um, and so, EDH is one of the things where you can kind of just play whatever you want to play. And it doesn't really, depending on if you want to play casual or competitive, you can delve into the archetypes and to what you want to play. And really, there is no really wrong answer necessarily in terms of casual EDH, what you're playing. Competitive, you can kind of make an argument for anything, but probably you're going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just kind of going from that aspect, like it is, for the most part, EDH is just kind of a safe home for kind of just, I just kind of want to hide under the cover of heavy constructed magic sometimes and just kind of the grinding aspect and just kind of like hey i'm gonna go to the ogs just kind of i want to find somebody to grind out like i am playing grixis dash out or something or modern i need to grind out like 10 games against kca to see how this matchup feels and compared to hey i'm just gonna go to the ogs roll up be like hey guys anyone want to play commander or et cetera, et cetera. it's been two hours that way so it's a lot more less stressful and it's a lot just more having fun with magic and less trying to make magic like it's somewhat like of a job to some degree (laughs) yeah so you you came to the format for similar reasons to why sheldon and the rules committee discuss having created it as a way to use their favorite cards in a lighter hearted and more relaxed setting yeah i would agree on that whereas for me i didn't discover commander until I was probably like 2013. So a few years after the first pre-cons came out, around the time when the second pre-con came out, because that was when Aloro was printed. And I remember that was my, I think, I think that was my first pre-con. And that was how I started the yeah. format. But it, I, I probably played the pre-constructed deck once ever and didn't really care for it because that doesn't really interest me. What really drew me was the deck building challenge that having a singleton 100 card deck but with access pretty much guaranteed I, at the time the tuck rule was not in place so it's sort of guaranteed cards like hinder nice and set. spell rupture could like deny you access to your commander but in general consistent and predictable access to a legendary creature and i i found that fascinating as opposed to playing modern at the time where you can build a deck around a card like Birthing Pod at the time where you would play these Malira Pod or these Angel Pod decks, Mm -hmm. you actually always had access to your commander. So it was a much more consistent build around 
with more in-game variants, which I found very interesting. Incidentally, the variants part was why I was actually drawn to decks like Angel Pod or like Malira Pod, because I liked the singleton toolboxy kind of nature. And so deck building in EDH felt kind of natural after that because it, it was basically the same thing. Oh, let me just grab like one of a Reclamation Sage and one of an Orsop Pontiff and jam it all together. And it's basically what a Birthing Pod deck at the time looked like outside of birds and Malira, I guess. Yeah, then you delved into Carador and EDH. Which <laughs> I don't see how that happened at all. Yeah, <laughs> shocker, right? So... That kind of deck building challenge, uh, almost a more spike driven entry into the format, was what really hooked me on Commander. But this is not just a podcast talking about Commander in general. So let's look at specifics, both casual and competitive. What is it that draws you to casual EDH? Um, for me personally, it is. Casual EDH, I enjoy having kind of, I can play whatever I want, kind of roll into a game with a certain strategy. Like you said, your commander kind of specifically affects the way you want to play the game. So choosing your commander based on whatever archetype you want to play, whatever type of colors you want to play, or whatever type of deck type you want to play to some degree is all dependent upon that. And you always have access to it, so you can always have a fail-safe to some degree, which you don't have in constructed formats. So, And it's always a late-game fantasy, which is not available in other formats also. So regardless of what happens in the game, you can primarily just feel like you're doing something, compared to which non-EDH formats and sometimes primarily constructed formats, you are not you get a sense of helplessness. Like when I fetch a turn one Delver, play it, and then they stick a Blood Moon. Exactly. Or they like. And then kill my Delver. Or they ship like three Simmons Spirit Guys and they're just like, hey, turn one Blood Moon or Chalice you on turn zero for one or Hope Ancient you like Tomb not Chalice. Spells. Yeah, let's have some fun. Which, you're getting competitive, but we'll go into that in a bit. Yeah. Um, but in casual, you're not going to have stuff like that going. And so, casual, more about just having fun. Like, I've had the most fun playing Magic, probably playing casual EDH and or playing some type of cube. Um, but. Casual ADH in general, like, if you have a camaraderie or just getting a playgroup is primarily preferred, but even just picking up games, usually the um, emotions between players are primarily very friendly, um, and everybody's usually just there to have fun. So, like, I've been to GPs plenty of times, and just on Sundays, just showed up to the commander area and just sat down and made new friends and just kind of see what people were playing. Because in Commander, you never know. It's like it's like Pandora's box. You never know what's gonna be. You yeah. never know what's gonna be in there. You can sit to a table and be, oh hey, somebody's playing five color dragons. The other person's playing uh, Linda the Dark Dusk Rose. Uh, the other person's playing like Carador, and I'm playing like Maelstrom Wander or something like that. You just, just so many like you never know what's gonna happen compared to other formats in which you just kind of hey, it's all matchup based. Yeah, at and, this point, I think we're closing in on 750 legal commanders. Mm -hmm. And if you include partner combinations, I think we're past 800 legal Jeez. commander pairings. Now, name them all. No. Pokemon style. I could do that, but I can't name commanders. Okay. There's so many legends <laughs> in Kamigawa that I just don't know. I, it's it's not going to happen. Ask Stephen Green next time to go to SCG <laughs> Con or to any SCG event, and he will probably know them all off the top of his head. That's probably true. Actually, no, probably ask Justin Purnell, and he'll probably just never talk to you or just, like, <laughs> give you the stink eye. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. So, I... You may know me from playing competitive EDH, but I also really enjoy casual EDH. Because of the play style I usually prefer in constructed gameplay that's transitioned. As Will mentioned earlier, Carador was one of the longest played decks I think I've ever had. It lasted me from casual all the way up into competitive, and then, as you would expect, back to casual <laughs> once partners were printed and Hulk got unbanned and, you know, shenanigans happened. But I had that deck together for years. Because it is specifically a play style I love. I love grinding out value. I love engines. I love birthing pod. I love Phyrexian Arena. I love Ristic Study. I love Carador. 
I love cards that let you get iterative value over turns. And that is something that is far more easily accessible in Casual Commander than it is in any other format that Magic offers, pretty much. Well, Casual Commander is pretty much, if you're building your deck, at least in my mind, and what I believe a Casual deck should be the best, is you essentially want to out two for one your opponent in the best way possible. And that means you want to have pretty much majority of the cards you have, unless they're specific like combo pieces or specific to whatever your commander is trying to do, like your card needs to replace itself and or get you some type of advantage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because you have three opponents, so mm-hmm. spending a card to do one thing is three for one card disadvantage mm-hmm. passively. So there's a much higher bar for what a card ought to do, even at the casual level, assuming you're playing some form of tuned. But that is not necessarily going to be the case in a format where you are playing to win. So in casual EDH, I think we can both agree that the social aspect of the format takes priority over the inherent TCG aspect of the format. It's more important to sit down and have a fun time than it is to be able to say, I built my deck to try and win, and I'm going to play to try and win. It's a trade-off in what you want to value during deck construction. Competitive, while it doesn't necessarily de-emphasize value on the social aspects of the format, which is something that we will probably cover in an entire podcast on its own, there is more value placed on being able to say, I am trying to win, I am trying to win optimally, and I am trying to not lose to anyone else while I'm doing it. So with that in mind, what is it about competitive EDH that you enjoy? For the most part, first off, I really like the length of the games is a lot shorter. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because I like, like, for casual EDH, my ideal time length of the game is usually, like, 12 to 20 turns i feel like that's probably accurate and that probably in human time depending on how if people play at a modern pace that's probably about an hour hour and a half maybe two hours that sounds fair you and i probably played some you and i played some marathon we played a 12 hour game that was the eight person game in which i drew my deck (gasps) four times through with consecrated sphinx and elixir of immortality (sighs) and one suck it I think I, like, died second in that game, and I think, like, I just, like, went out Oh, to... yeah, you had left before Josh I, like, died. I think I went out to get, like, alcohol, and then <laughs> it came back, and you guys... I was like, why are you guys still playing? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't but... participate in games with more than five players anymore. Yeah, I don't... PSA for people at LGS is that roll up to a group of five pe- or four players that are playing commander and they're like hey do you guys want a fifth just no just no just no just an order to them we don't it's nothing against you personally but it's, you it's can watch the sanctity of the format is four people if you yeah. go more than that it is going to be a complete nut house and yeah. no one has fun because people will take 15 minute turns times five it takes forever and shuffling and uh, yeah. just resolving mulligans takes like half an hour <laughs> i will actively and have consistently you've even been around when i've done this if someone shows up and is like hey do you guys have a spot can i play i will happily get up move next to someone else and watch a game yeah then play in a five person pot at this point five it's oh, a mess my god i don't want it so anyway going back to why like competitive aside from the shorter games um it kind of feels into you have less feels into the archetypes more that are kind of played into normal constructed magic archetypes so you can kind of do parallels between okay this person has a control deck this person has this taxes deck this somebody has the hate bearers deck somebody this one has some type of storm combo deck etc etc compared to like I said earlier, one of the reasons why I love casual EDH is you have the Pandora's box effect. You don't know what the hell is coming out. <laughs> okay, my opponent's tapping five mana. I don't know what they're casting. Or they're ca- tapping nine mana, and it's like, 
you just kind of cast hold, Iona? Like, you symbolically just kind of hold the table when you're mine. You're like, I don't know what's coming, but I hopefully I'm still alive after this is done. Um, and you kind of have less of that in competitive EDH because you the lists are so tuned at this point, to some degree, depending on whenever set's released, what's upcoming set release now, and I'm sure there's Dan and the rest of the Lab Maniacs will go into their feelings on the cards and what they feel are the best. I think there are probably some good ones in this set. Oh, there's... Oh, my God. This set is so good. Because um, Ravikant Allegiance is kind of nuts in terms of every aspect. It honestly might be one of the best sets released in the last... It is it better than Dominaria? I don't know. Uh, so... Play design, I'll gush about this in our set review. Play design has been killing it recently. Like, I think it might be better than Dominaria, honestly. It might Just be the in... best set since Return to Ravnica. <sighs> Maybe Khans. Khans was pretty Khans high is power. Pretty good. Kaladesh was stupid. I would probably put this on, like, Khans level. Yeah, and I feel like the power level is kind of going back to what Khans, minus, like, a Siege Rhino. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Siege Rhino was good, but. Everyone else knows that. Um, but just kind of competitive EDH in general, you just kind of... you. So when your opponent... You have your hand. Okay. You know what your opponent potentially is probably going to have. So it's okay. My opponent's playing blue. They probably have Force Will. They probably have Swan Song. They probably have... Um, Fluster Storm. Pack Fluster Negation. Storm, Pack Negation. Mana Drain. Maybe even Counterspell. Yeah, maybe even Counterspell. Mental Misstep, for sure. Mental Misstep. Always, when you're trying to cast your Mystic Remora or Soul Ring on turn one, never on the person yeah. before you. Spell Pierce. Um, just so, cheap cheap interaction that you can kind of gauge off the top of your head. And just kind of, if you play competitive a lot, you'll kind of pick up on the, like, little intricacies of the format. And just kind of, okay, this is the card pool. And if you've kind of played a lot of competitive magic in general... You can kind of gauge upon, okay, these are the cards that are probably good in this format. Because they're the cards that are probably good in vintage and most legacy. formats, which is <laughs> legacy, vintage, and modern. And smidge modern. Um, but you can kind of gauge upon that. And just kind of just kind of testing your metal of the format kind of against each other. I feel like competitive VDH is more of a format based upon how well you know the format. And not necessarily how good your deck is necessarily because your deck can be really good and your deck can be awesome but if you don't know what everybody else is doing everybody else is playing you're gonna have a hard time yeah we were actually having a conversation about this on play edh recently uh luke and i were talking with some people who were using the discord and it seems from our perspective that deck choice as long as it meets a certain standard of competitive which in and of itself is already another podcast topic how well the player knows the opponent's decks the opponents themselves and the general cedh meta determines their win rate more than what their actual deck selection is because being able to play your opponent there's three opponent's decks you're only picking one knowing what to play around almost matters more than what you're actually playing and competitive EDH, unlike constructed formats, you have the diplomacy aspect of it. So you can kind of play, there's the game that's on the table, and then there's the game that's going on between the competitors in the so-called arena. Yeah. It's just the mind games, and just kind of, hey, you know, I can counter this, but can you counter that? Or are you going to let this happen? Or are you going to try to stop what I'm trying to do to prevent what you're trying to do? Yeah, people like to talk about how politics don't play a role in competitive EDH, and to some degree, I feel that's a bit disingenuous. I think it would be more accurate to say that bargaining and deals and that kind of politics are fairly ineffective in CEDH because it is difficult to make a deal with someone when they're also trying to beat you. But table talk, discussing threat assessment, and priority order baiting yes. are hugely impactful in competitive EDH. And I would say that all falls into the realm of politics because me indicating to you that a certain spell resolving a certain way would be negatively impactful on both of our abilities to win the game because of X, Y, or Z that I'm expecting he has in his hand or that person C has because I get taxi and probed them and they're going to be able to like flash in a notion thief, that kind of thing is 
politics while not being bargaining because it's collaborative threat assessment. And so that social aspect, I think, does play a huge role in uh, competitive EDH. And I think that's one of the aspects that casual is kind of severely lacking on and just kind of more tying into what I was saying earlier about the competitive EDH really fo- harping on your knowledge of the format and how it's a lot more constrictive on the card pool. And so you can kind of analyze and kind of learn matchups and cards. Casual, people people that, don't, people that are playing casual EDH don't necessarily, it might be their first time playing Commander. It might be their 10th time. You're getting people that are playing competitive EDH, they're going to be around Magic for 5, 10 years. Primarily, or at least a year. Like people don't people don't play Magic, and within six months they're like, "Oh my God, we're gonna play competitive VDH. I'm gonna play Soul Rain, Man of All, yeah. Time Twister, You Two and One." It is very <laughs> rare that you see competitive VDH players without relatively significant experience, at least in casual EDH. So, and that leads into threat assessment in general because they know what is good and what is healthy in the specific game state, and so you don't have necessarily in casual EDH player knowledge is kind of something that is lacking which is kind of has its positives and it has its negatives um because if you're kind of a casual player and you kind of want to win sometimes you can kind of neg some edges and just kind of hey you know maybe my opponents don't know how this interaction works maybe my opponents don't know the threat of hey if I play this one card I get this other card that's going to combo off etc so hey I'm going to cast my mana geyser Get a billion mana, <laughs> tend to splinter twin combo you. Oh, that doesn't work. Then okay, I'm gonna flash back and like torment how far everybody for like thirty. Yeah, this is what I do in one of my casual decks. It's wonderful. Uh-huh. It's wonderful. Mm, wonderful for you. It's grand. Kess is amazing. Kess Kess is pretty sweet. We can agree on that. For me, competitive EDH is all about the high power cards. I love powerful cards in Magic. I love casting Ancestral Recall. I love casting Moxin. I love casting... Well, I hate casting Necropotence, but I love putting it into play off a Zerg Trigger. That that sort of thing. The cards that are either restricted in Vintage, outright banned in Legacy, or would never see print in Modern or Standard are the cards that I usually have the most fun playing. And competitive EDH is in my opinion, the best way to enjoy them. Because, well, for starters, Vintage is... I'm I'm sorry, Rich Shea, it's a dead format. No one plays it outside of, like, two LGSs ever and the occasional proxy tournament that Tales of Adventure hosts. Or or Moto, and I... Let's not. You know, Moto, it's, like, crazy expensive to get into it. It's still a couple hundred bucks, yeah. Legacy is still really hard to find, and has banned half the cards I like. I can't play Demonic Tutor. I can't play Necropotence. I can't play Time Twister. So what am, what am I really doing? Standstill is horrible in Legacy, so why would I play it? You could technically play Standstill, but... Oh, I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> but you've, I've, you've, you've tried. <laughs> I've watched plenty of Standstill games in the hopes of seeing something new, but that deck is so bad in Legacy. Like that, deck, that deck is good. That was It was fine in the days in which, like, I don't know, you have some... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to make you feel better, but... Don't. <laughs> Don't. They haven't been sleeved in years. Ugh, there's a reason. Yeah. But so I like these really strong cards, which is incidentally why I was so mad that they never actually released... I don't know if you ever heard this. They intended to release a silver-bordered product that had some stupid name, but it was intended to be balanced around Ancestral Recall as a fair magic card. So basically Pokemon, but with magic cards as like a silver border product for like a, hey, what if Ancestral Recall wasn't broken? What if Ancestral Recall was the baseline for blue draw spells? Are you going to have like three mana draw sevens? Well, we have those now. Yeah, We have like 30 of them now. Yeah. But I I so wish they had made that product because I would have had so much fun playing that thing casually in 60 card with people. When was that supposedly going to come out? Oh my god, like 15 years ago. It's so dead. It doesn't matter. But anyways... I Coming like Ultimate Masters twenty eighth, <laughs> twenty three. Get your mythic edition now with your <laughs> promo fart moxin. That's what's coming when magic is 
maybe gonna die in like 2035 <laughs> or something. They're gonna break out the your full art dual lands. Hey yeah. guys, Wizard <laughs> List is gone. Buy our 300 Mythic Edition. Uh, I see you, Wizards. I see uh, what you're doing. Yeah, so those kind of cards are why I like competitive EDH. You can enjoy them consistently, you can enjoy them in a social way, and you can enjoy them with a super easily accessible player base. Well, also in competitive, everybody else is playing them at that point, too. Yeah. And so you roll up into a casual play group. Oh, hey, go turn one, mox in, mox in, soul ring, blah, 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 blah. They're going to be like... What is this? Hey, what bro, is this what card? you doing? <laughs> what is this? Is this real? That's probably going to be the first question. They're probably going to be like, is that real? Or what is that card? Or how expensive is that? Yeah. I can still remember the time I played that, like, back of a basic proxy tabernacle <laughs> turn one in the Get game against you, you and Josh. Tabernacles. Oh, my God. I was playing Progenitus Lands at the time. Had no idea oh, how expensive Tabernacle was. I was just like, oh, I don't have this card. This seems fair. Yeah. It wasn't. Turn one Tabernacle against the, like, what was it? He was playing Sig, Tribal so Merfolk. Uh, was he playing Merfolk? Yeah. I think I was playing, like, Vampires or something. Yeah, you were. Two Tribal decks, yeah. Turn 1 Tabernacle. Olivia, and, yeah, you were playing as Olivia deck. It was days in which we did have, like... It was free. I won that game so hard. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, we're like, damn, what is that? Pro-? First off, I didn't even know what Tabernacle was at that I point. Know. I had no idea what that card was. Uh, and then I was like, okay... That sucks. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this card's probably like 50 bucks. And Josh is, or he was like, oh, no, it's like. Comically, if it was $300 at the time, now it's like, like 12 or 14 well, or something. Those like undergrad seas were like. Cost the same as like polluted like deltas. 50, 100, 100 yeah. 120 or so for that. Yeah, anyways. Oh, my God. You should have bought them. <laughs> yeah, with all that <laughs> undergrad money I had. I should have bought them, too. Yeah. So I like strong cards like those. And I also like high-paced gameplay, which. I don't know if you've played casual. Doesn't really happen there much. You get a lot of turns of land pass, or not even land and pass. People thinking over things that don't really have much of a board impact, and then not doing anything. As opposed to competitive EDH, where turn one, if you don't have a play, you're on the back foot. Turn two, if you're not resolving relevant cards to your game plan, you're really behind. And on turn three, if you're not either pressuring a win or strangling people out of theirs, you probably picked a bad deck or need to shuffle better. And that's one of the differences and kind of one of the things of necessarily of what I, why I don't like competitive to some degree compared to casual is because competitive EDH is so backbreaking when you miss a step. And so if you do not have the mana ramp or you don't have acceleration or if you miss some type of card draw effect, you're going to get severely punished very quickly, and you just kind of feel at the table, to some degree, helpless, and you just kind of can't really, you can't help out your opponents to prevent somebody when you can't help somebody out to win to some degree. Compared to casual, where most people, depending on what type of decks they're playing, they might have some type of effect that, hey, you know, somebody's going to cast, like, a Boundless Realms, or, like, Knights of, or Rites of Flourishing, or some type of, a Mana Flayer. God, don't people, people don't play your Mana Flayers and... Play the one-sided mana flares. Don't play everybody gets a mana flare because that never ends well. Yeah. Um, but just kind of casual is a lot more helping and just kind of aiding to, hey, I missed a step or I missed a land drop. Am I going to get super punished? I can kind of have a couple turns to kind of gain up. Or maybe there's something later in the game which I can kind of gain up. Yeah. Compared the only to- times I'm ever punished for falling behind in casual are when I play with you. Because well, yeah. you love to kick me when I'm down. Well, yeah, you're Dan. What else? <laughs> That's what your middle name is. Kick them all is down. <laughs> Meanwhile, my, my goal in casual EDH, just for all the listeners to be here, if I'm the same, if I'm the same playgroup as Dan, my goal is to murder him or just disrupt whatever he's doing. Ninety-five percent of the time, I need to rename the card <laughs> Bazooka Bog to Dan Bog. <laughs> I don't think I've ever kept a graveyard in a game where you had a Bojukabog in your deck. Just because I will do everything in my... Like, I have Demonic Tutor for Bojukabogs <laughs> before just to get you. It wasn't even a good position. I no, have 12 cards no, in my you graveyard. Gotta, you gotta put you gotta put you in your place. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta uh, let them know where, when it's coming. 
So on that note, let's transition to talking about the specific decks we like to play. There's a lot of different archetypes that you can play, both in casual, real broad archetypes, and in competitive, which are much more focused archetypes. So what kind of archetypes do you prefer in casual? So in casual, I primarily lean toward kind of heavy mid-range, heavy card draw, and or type of controlling-esque decks. Um, so the personal decks that I built now, I have a Carador deck, I have a Kess deck, I have a Modratha deck, missing one. Oh, I have Rune. I thought you took him apart. No, I have Rune. Oh, you took apart Keanos yeah. and Tiro for Rune. Yeah, it's like a part, it, yeah. yeah, the butt bros. <laughs> um, and I'm in the process of building an Alicia deck and some type of rug deck if anyone wants to help me build a casual. Oh, yeah, this is your Thrasios Tana Yeah, Thrasios stuff. Tana. We don't have the other 98 cards picked out yet. We deck. have no idea. I have a giant mound of <laughs> teamer colored cards in Raptica my binder. Raptica Allegiant Staples. <laughs> Yeah. That'll be it. Well, I was waiting for the set because they got yeah. some good things. Yeah, they do. I'm gonna, I just want to flicker the giant worm guy that <laughs> blows up people's lands. <laughs> Infinitely Ravager, for just, like, just stick them on a dino navigator um, and just make people hate themselves. And you can also... Actually, no, that's kind of sweet. You can, like, that's pretty people. sweet. Yeah, that's a very sweet. Yeah, that's kind of sweet. So, one of my favorite cards... Probably my favorite card in... Casual Asian, one of my favorite cards in kind of magic in general is Tireless Tracker. And I feel like that can kind of gauge upon the type of casual EDH I like to play. Yeah. If so you I can't like, play Tireless Tracker, you're probably not playing the deck. Exactly. So I like to just kind of play my lands, draw some cards. If I'm not hitting a land drop on a turn, there's something wrong and I'm not having fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or if I'm not drawing extra cards. <laughs> that is an accurate assessment of games with you in them. Um, so usually, like I was saying before... I usually build my decks in terms of I'm going to two for one you to death. All my cards are going to do something. I'm going to play all the Mole Drifter, Cloud Blazer type effects and just go to town. <laughs> yeah, that is that is very succinctly you. The decks I prefer are heavily mid-range engine based, like I alluded to in the cards I like in casual. Carador and Mirin and decks like that pretty much epitomize my enjoyed casual play styles. I want to be grinding value, preferably with some sort of graveyard-based interactions, just because I like the concept of having a 40-card hand and a 10-card hand. Well, the graveyard in casual is easily the best resource in yeah. the game. It's almost free, yeah. because so few people run sufficient graveyard hate, which mm -hmm. is why pods without will in them are much more fun than pods with will in them, because yeah. I can keep my graveyard almost all the time in pods without will. Hey man, you gotta gotta have that Nile spiral, Nile spiral, ugh, spell bomb, not spiral bomb. I think spiral bomb's probably another cycle that's coming in. Return of the scars. No, that's twenty twenty one. Actually, it might happen. Hey, I want to, I want to mind Koth coming back. He's kind of cool. Yeah. They need a red. Who's gonna? They need a red mage other than Jaya and Chandra and Tybalt. Chandra's and... gonna die. <laughs> That's a bold call, prediction. Call, call it now. Someone from the Gate Watch is gonna die. It's probably gonna be Gideon. I hope it's Chandra, because I don't like Chandra. I just you I got like some Gideon I got lot. some beef with her. I like Gideon a lot. Gideon has helped me win in many games in all of his many forms. Yeah. Chandra has made me lose. I don't know about his Gate Crash form. Ugh. Hey, you forgot about that one. Is that a card? Yeah, his plus adds loyalty equal to the number of creatures your opponents control or something. I feel like that was, like, the start of the, like, new plans. Like, I feel like that's, like, the Kaya of Gaker. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Will, please. <laughs> I know you love that card, so I'm just messing with <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, so really I just want to be able to use my graveyard as another hand. If I can do that in casual, I'm satisfied. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I just have horrible, horrible decks built for the purpose of being bad. Like People people of listeners of this episode of the podcast, I need you this is a PSA out, personal PSA. You need to send Dan a some casual fun deck list <laughs> that he will enjoy so he can Burn all physical copies <laughs> of the Sh what? Sh Shauna deck. <laughs> oh my god. The deck's crowning moment was putting a sigil of the Nyan gods oh on god. Shauna when I had no other creatures. You no, that you're playing a Shauna. You have no token makers in that deck. You have like main deck plummet. <laughs> I do. 
I literally thought you like drunkenly just built this deck one day. You're just like awake at two a.m. You just see Shauna on your desk, and you're like, yeah, uh, why not? You know, I'm gonna <laughs> she get. I have a temple garden. Why not? Just, just <laughs> I like can actually a... cut temple garden from it. It's even worse. I pretty much put together the worst green-white cards I could find with a few staples, and then I cut the staples. What staples are in it? <laughs> I used to have, like, Nature's Claim and stuff like that, and then I cut those for the worst on-color foils I could oh, find in my God. collection. Oh, yeah, that is true. Like, I'm playing, I'm playing the Madness Disenchant with no ways of discarding it. Ugh. It is just a three-mana Disenchant. Like, I feel like that deck is, like, the equivalent of my Legacy deck and just, like, <laughs> pissing people off who see it. It just makes them mad because of how terrible it is. On a different note, I don't only play decks like that. Let's talk about I, competitive I archetypes. What do you like to play in competitive EDH? So I primarily have leaned toward the Blood Pod field of playing. I like my hate bears. You do. I like my stacks type of games because I feel like that is something that in competitive I can kind of play and be competitive. In casual, I'm just going to piss everybody off and we're not going to have a lot of fun and everyone's just going to be miserable <laughs> at the table. Would you agree? Like, everyone's going to be miserable at the table for like... That's that's or, how casual or, stacks or, tends to work. Or you're going to turn a two-hour game into a four-and-a-half-hour game. Yeah. It's just a long gets it. Um, and so I've really enjoyed Blood Pod. Um, Timna's kind of busted. <laughs> kind of busted. Just, just a tad. Uh, Tana is very good. I like things that make tokens. I like tokens. They're fun. And I just like killing people. Like I like to beat I like to beat down. I wanna beat down in competitive EDH just because no one everyone's afraid of beating down to some degree because they're all just like I wanna scepter Thrasios people to death. And I'm just gonna sit here and put it's like, no, I'm gonna put you from forty to zero and we're gonna have some fun. <laughs> I wanna see the look on your face when you're like taking thirty. <laughs> Oh, so your favorite competitive deck is playing casual EDH as viably as possible. That would be an appropriate assessment. But, like, I'll delve into... I've played, like, your Thrapter... Er, yeah, you played Thrasius, you've played yeah, Sir. Yeah, Scepters, or... Um, You're capable enough at Storm that you can play pretty yeah, much any Storm deck. I can kind of Storm figure deck. it out. Flash Hulk you struggled with. I... Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure you cast Flash. You were like, I have the Hulk in hand. <laughs> what do I do with my deck? <laughs> Yeah, well, I didn't have like an LED, so I couldn't like infinitely kill people. Um, but I don't know. I just don't need to figure out how that deck works. I don't. I've never. That was the first time I've ever seen a Protean Hulk, because the entire existence of me playing EDH and just Magic in general, it has been banned. Yeah, it has been that card that is mysterious. It is like the Wizard of Oz of the magic community. Like, I don't know what's behind the thing. It's like, oh, it's it, the Protean Hulk is here? What does this thing even do? Yeah. Oh, that seems kind of broken. I should probably get some of those. You would think. They're pretty cheap now. They're like two bucks. Foils aren't. Foils are still like, I mean, I, I don't know. Whatever. Anyways. We can talk about card prices. Another yeah, day. yeah. Oh, God. Coming up card on prices. episode number seven. <laughs> talk about how card prices are ruining magic no I'm just kidding. but to some degree yes <laughs> so while you like the very creature based almost aggro stacks decks i very very heavily am biased towards mid-range blue decks pretty much anything that can run the like blue black x core that i've talked about in a couple of reddit posts Anything like Xur, Thrasios and Timna, Brea, Kess, Timna Crown, literally anything that I can play. The Counterspell package of Force, Drain, Pact, Misstep, the Tutor package of Vamp, Imperial, Demonic, the just the, the good, the really, my archetypes I prefer are the ones that run as many of my favorite cards as I like. In casual, that's the birthing pod suite. Yeah. In competitive, that is the cantrip tutor counterspell suite. And so those are the decks that play them all. Mm -hmm. And I really prefer their play style because, Will can attest to this, I'm not actually that great a magic player. 
I don't have the best ability to table read. I'm okay at gauging opponents, but like it's not a strength of mine. So I would much rather play a deck where I don't have to sniff out when people have interaction or when they're bluffing and jam a combo underneath someone like a good Gitrog or a good Tazri player can do. Mm -hmm. I would rather use cards like Force of Will or Mental Misstep to create openings and then go off where I don't need to necessarily have a spider sense to be able to win because I'm just awful at that. Well, you just kind of goes into, I know he has these cards. I know he has, okay, how can I beat a Force of Will? How can I beat... What if my opponent has two Force of Wills? Or two of my <laughs> opponents have Force of Wills? You know, what if somebody has a Spell Pierce? And that's something you don't have that is terrifying to me in terms of competitive because as someone who's played a good amount of Legacy in my day, having to worry about if my opponent, my one opponent, has multiple Force of Wills is terrifying. And then worrying about in a competitive game, okay, what if all my opponents have a Force of Will? Plus, what else do they have? Three blue players, <laughs> each with three to five blue mana untapped. Exactly. And you're just kind of like, okay, I'm trying to resolve, like, this Blood Moon. I don't think it's going to happen. There is zero possibility, but then sometimes you don't because it's a singleton format. So what is, like, what is the probability that they even have one of those cards? Have they tutored? Have they have seen any amount of card draw? Have they prioritized? Have they pondered? Have they... Scryed anything? Have they any type of card filtering effect or deck manipulation type of theory goes into just kind of running through the cards and numbers? Numbers, <laughs> like what's the percentage? And that's something that, like you said, you're not necessarily good at. And that's that spider sense type of feeling in which you don't necessarily pick up on. You don't get that kind of edge unless you really are a heavy like competitive player. And that's honestly from me personally, where I gauged and kind of learned that aspect was primarily playing through limited. It's just kind of learning the silver bullet kind of aspect of magic and just kind of learning, okay, tells, like tells and magic and trying to, what you can read from on board information leads to hand information. And that's a really big tell. And just kind of going on through that, um, just do many. This is a stupid question. I know this is gonna be a stupid question. I'm gonna get flamed for this. How many like, how many like duress thoughts these effects do the blue black decks playing competitive? Nearly zero. Okay, that's what I thought because I was like, that is a really big tale, and that's why Thoughtseize is such a like polarizing card to some degree because it's very telling on what you can as an opponent who's getting Thoughtseized or duress or any type of discard effect card. You can get a tell onto what your opponent has, and like ED, competitive EDH doesn't really have those, and so the tells into what people have in their hands is a lot harder, and it's a lot more difficult compared to casual, where it's I don't really care what you have in my hand. I'm just gonna jam. I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm just gonna jam whatever I have. Yeah. People aren't playing Force of Wills for the most part. When someone casts their Plasm Capture, you hear audible exactly. gasps. Exactly. Or like, yeah, play. Plasm Capture is a sweet card. <laughs> um. That's going in that talk. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Building it as we speak. Um, but yeah, like cryptic commands, like um, mystic confluence. <laughs> that card is, oh. But that is like, you're not going to see it in competitive. It's like in casual EH, like, hey, you know, five mana up. He, he's probably going to tap out for one spell. In competitive EDH, my opponent has four or five cards in, spe- Force, in hand. Force, misstep. Then he mana drains, then he spell pierces your counter, and then he fluster storms your fluster storm. Exactly. Because, and then he still has mana open. Because, like, a converted mana cost of competitive EDH decks are, like, at least on normal. Like, you're playing Dark Confidants in your black decks. Yeah. It's and like so, 1.8 for most blue black decks. Yeah, 1.8 like to. Maybe 2.2 for creature reanimator in, kind of in decks. In most casual, let's go casual blue black based decks. What, you're. Mana cost is probably five, four, four. Three to five to four? It's big. <laughs> Like, you're playing, you're trying to play Crypt Commands, you're trying to play your Mystic Confluence, you're trying to play, like, your Shield Dreads. Yeah. And not, like, you're hard casting them. Yeah. You're not just trying to, like, yeah. reanimate them or, like, animate dead them yeah. or some type of effect. Um, 
and just kind of going upon that is just it's really hard to tell what like kind of people have at times and what and that it's it's kind of polarizing and one of the things that's kind of good it's something that's attractive to competitive age because that's something you completely miss that a lot of the more spiky people in the world they're going to be hey you know in casual i don't have the mind games in my head i'm not really like playing games within myself to test to see okay how can i prove that i'm the best person at this table because in casual it really comes down to to some degree hey you know my synergy of my deck or draws dependent competitive it's hey i know this format i know what you're gonna do i have a specific game plan in my head to stop what you're trying to do and how does that affect my game plan compared to casual where you're just, you don't you don't know you don't know what's going on <laughs> yeah all twenty thousand cards are potentially on the table yeah i love when people play like one like one drop creatures that are mana dorks and <laughs> like casual edh oh like you're flying men yeah, like you're gonna play a flying man, or you're gonna play like a like a Boros elite, oh, something God. like that. <laughs> like some some type of load, like a Legion loyalist. I or always feel like bad that. when I like, see that in EDH. Uh, one drops that aren't mandatories. Get out of here in casual. So speaking of things we dislike, unless it's, like, dry, unless it's uh, dry melt. That card's, that card's sweet. pretty good. <laughs> what are some of the archetypes you dislike playing against in casual? For casual archetypes, I do not like... I dislike playing against Mill. <laughs> I think that is true of everybody. I totally forgot that was even an archetype. Oh, God. It, <laughs> there is there is specific... I will... There's a specific place in hell for burn players and, like, lantern players. Like, lantern-esque, like, play, like lantern-esque decks. Because, like, it's... They're not stacks, but it's, like... Oh, God. It's just, it, they're frustrating. <laughs> they're so frustrating. And just, like, any amount, like, for me personally, for archetypes, graveyard archetypes can be very frustrating, depending on who your playgroup is and what you're playing at the table. Because if you're the only person at the table who's trying to um, deal with the graveyard, so, like, let's say I'm playing in a playgroup with Dan and two other people. Dan's playing his mirror deck. I'm not playing something else that has that much graveyard or hate in it. You're playing Rune with no Bojukabog. Yeah, I don't have Bojukabog in Rune. Pretty I, pretty hard to be able to put Bojukabog in Rune. I hate, I have, oh, I have the, um, that angel that ETBs XLs graveyards. Yeah, you have yeah. one card. It's like a seven drop or something. Yeah. No, isn't I think it? it's like three mana. That... Either card way. name is completely blank on me. Yeah. I think I've cast it like three times in my entire life. <laughs> um, it mainly goes away to like a ponder or like some type of filter <laughs> effects. Because it, most of the times in casual you're not playing as graveyard decks. Most people are just playing, hey, I'm going to play red, white, angels. Calumny, beat your face in and lose to anybody who has a real game plan. Yeah. The, like the one unfortunate thing about the archetypes in casual though is that like to some degree you're kind of locked out of color types and that's kind of true of competitive and there's kind of major color disparity in commander but that's kind of more of critiquing of the format in general and i guess we'll kind of go into that more into the another episode <laughs> but yeah there's some a lot of color disparity for me personally while boros doesn't necessarily make me I, I don't dislike playing against it. It just makes me feel sad when I play against it because I know there's no chance this person is winning the game and they're probably also going to have a horrible time because Boros decks really struggle when built well to do anything impactful. Like they might deal like 10 or 15 damage to a person over the course of a game. And even in casual, then like the first board wipe goes off and... Okay. <laughs> go away motorcycle. Like a red-white recovery... You can't elvish soul tiller your angels back. There's like elixir of immortality. You have like return know. the ranks. Yeah, there's not much. It's but very, very limited options, and people don't even usually play them because they're so bad that you're done if someone board wipes. I like to nickname Red White as the mythic deck <laughs> um, in casual EDH in terms of, hey, I'm playing Red White. I'm just going to play all the mythic and rares that I own of that color. <laughs> Look how cool I am. 
Which is really what it comes down to for the most part. Yeah, it's like, hey, I'm going to play Elyra. I'm going to play some giant dragon. Yeah. I'm going to play my sublime archangel. Yeah. Um, et cetera, et cetera. But the archetypes I, I actively dislike playing against and at this point in my life will typically refuse to play with, not out of spite for the player, but just because it is not worth my time to play, are Group Hug and Chaos. For two very specific reasons. The first one is that they fundamentally violate the concept of a TCG. And that not only are you not building your deck to win or playing your deck to win, you're trying to do something totally opposite of that. With Chaos decks, unlike stacks, which some people argue is built to make people miserable and stall the game out and stuff like that. Chaos decks are typically built with no parity breakers because it's really hard to break parity on targets are chosen at random. Like, you can't parity break that. You can parity break a winter orb. And stacks decks do that. They preferentially pick pieces that they can play around because they're built to win. They're built to slow other people and use tempo so that they can gain advantage. Chaos decks just... Throw a bunch of coin flips into a game for no reason, artificially bloating the time to actually play. Like, have you ever resolved a, a Warp World or a Scrambleverse or a Thieves Oxen Auction? I have seen too many Warp Worlds resolved in my time. It's abysmal. It takes like 10 minutes to resolve a spell for no real gain. No. So Chaos decks just really, really bother me because they're built to just waste people's time. In a, in a way that stacks decks and control decks aren't. Those decks are built to win. Chaos decks have no other goal than just making people unhappy. And that frustrates me on a moral level. Group hug decks, whether intentionally or not, are more of a direct buff to the first person untapping after the group hug player than they are a real viable deck option. They... They're, they're closer to someone being a collusion target than they are to someone being an active player at the table. Because if you're giving advantage to everyone in a multiplayer format, that advantage is not evenly distributed. I feel like group hug decks is like a good parallel to like the government shutdown right now. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of like, <laughs> Donald Trump is just the group hug player. And he's like, hey, guys, everybody wants what I'm trying to give out, right? And everyone else is like, do we really have to do this? Like, are we really going to have to give in to this eventually? <laughs> then he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to make you guys do this. You guys are going to have to, I'm going to pull an executive order. And we're going to have to build this wall. We're gonna have to, everyone's going to have to draw seven cards. You guys don't have a choice. You have to. <laughs> oh, we should avoid politics. Let's move on. Hey, I, I couldn't resist. That was that was a good. That was a good, that's a good comparison. There's one. I would like to add another archetype that I say severely dislike in casual ADH, which is, um, like the Planeswalker tribal decks. Super friends. Super friends. You literally just do nothing. It's the like the opposite of the chaos decks and the group hug decks to some degree. Of you're causing people. To feel miserable because you're just like, it's really you're playing a three player game when people are interacting with them because they just don't do anything. Like, they don't, okay, I'm gonna play this Planeswalker. You don't play creatures, you don't play other things. Well, you're playing a track site as your commander 95% of the time. <laughs> Okay, do you have the mana to support that? Most of the time when I see, like, the Atraxa players, Atraxa group oh, hug, or uh, Atraxa super friends players, they just can't even cast their spells properly. The pre-con mm. level mana bases exactly. that give them no consistent mana and on trying to, like, I, just, I, I feel bad whenever I see those decks because it's just, people spend, like, Planeswalkers ain't cheap. Most of them are expensive. So people were spending, two like, hundreds of dollars on a player. Like, I get it if that's what you want to do. But, like, for me personally... It's just kind of, uh, it's not something I want to delve into. Yeah, that's totally fair. How about competitive? I don't like the Hulk decks. <laughs> the what? The Hulk decks. Oh. Hulk. <laughs> uh, maybe because I don't really understand how necessarily <laughs> they work. 
I understand how they work. I just, and this goes back to what I was talking earlier, and I've reiterated plenty of times throughout this podcast, of card knowledge and format knowledge. I, I know how Storm decks work. I know how blue combo decks work. I know how stacks decks work. I have no idea how the Protean Hulk decks work <laughs> to some degree because I just never have interacted with that card ever. It's nothing against them. I I think it's a cool deck. I just, for me personally, I just, that deck, I just, it's like I'm F6ing the table when somebody's trying to go off with it because I just don't know. If it makes or, you feel any better, they keep changing too. Breakfast Hulk was on Angel of Glory's Rise, then it was on Muldratha. Now Breakfast Combo does something with Kozilek. And there's also this Sacred Hulk thing that I saw once, and it's like an instant speed breakfast Hulk, but it's, I don't know. Are they just trying to, like, cozy like, like, loop? I don't know. It's called Shuffle Hulk. It's just even yeah. more confusing. Because, like, when it hits the graveyard, it shuffles yeah. you. That's weird. It's, it's, I, I guess know. it draws cards. It's, is that Food Chain in the deck? No. Like, it, Bre- Hulk is getting confusing for me, so I'm avoiding it. For me, in competitive, I really really dislike playing pods, as some of you probably already know, with the kind of put my head down, I have blinders on, tunnel vision, I'm going to try and combo, I have nothing to say to anyone else at the table, I have no interaction, I barely have any protection, I'm just going to jam my combo every opportunity I get. The all-in decks. Yeah. I think that those decks border on king-making, because they either win the game instantly, Or they toss the game to the first person who is proactive to untap after them. Because they either eat a bunch of counter spells and then lose, and then just sit there and do nothing. Or they just eat a bunch of counter spells, sit there and do nothing usually. That's been my experience playing against them. They pretty solidly don't win because three opponents having interaction is... Yeah, it's expected. A lot, it's it's kind of like the equivalent of like the Oops All Spells deck yeah. in Legacy, but compared to okay, is my opponent playing blue? F- number one question: If Oops All Spells deck in Legacy, my opponent playing blue, they have Force of Will. Okay, they're not playing blue. Guns to the races. Let's go, boys. But in competitive EDH, doesn't everyone primarily plays blue outside of Blood Pod? Pretty much every single popular deck. And honestly, if you're not playing blue, you gotta have a hell of a good reason yeah. to there's not like, be playing blue. There's like Yisan and Selvala, and I don't like Selvala because it falls into this category. And Yisan plays a decent amount of spheres and stuff. So that like you're playing as opponents that have okay, Silver Bullet theory, theory, three Force of Wills. You're potentially trying to get potentially fight through, plus whatever else they got. Yeah, I don't can... think you're gonna get there, buddy. <laughs> it it seems like, in, in my experience, I know not everyone has this experience, and that's why people like to play these decks. I have never seen them consistently be a positive deck in a pod. They just kind of, like, slam their face on the table, and then someone else wins. And I just don't find that to be a desirable game. We can discuss competitive edges all we want, but... At the end of the day, it is still a social format, and it just doesn't engage me to have someone playing that way, which is why I prefer to not play against decks like that. should put them all in, like, one pod and see who can, like, finish the race first. That's the thing! Breakfast Hulk is still faster, and it plays blue! People why? Like, people like their Savals. I know. It's a good card. I know. It's fine. I just don't like not playing blue. It feels wrong in a format with Force of Will and Time Twister, and I don't like not playing black you just in like a format resol- with you Demonic just, Tutor and Vampiric Tutor. You just love resolving brainstorms. I love resolving brainstorms, Will. <laughs> I feel like Will. it's true of like 99% of the people who are probably listening to this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I hope so. That'd be a cool poll. To so the 1% of you out there, brainstorm. I highly endorse it. <laughs> Once you go back, it's like it's like some type of uh I'm not even gonna go there, but <laughs> Yeah. So with me complaining about totally not just Godo, don't feel discriminated against Godo players. 
I like you, Tony. Oh, I don't like the Goto deck. But that category in general. Helm of the Host is a cool card, though. It is a pretty sweet card. You know it was designed by a member of the design team who plays Goto in EDH? That does, he consistently that does not slips. surprise me at all. He consistently tries to seed cards for Goto into sets. It is he cracks the, is he me the up. guy that made the, like, Mill Shield? I don't know. The Ravnica Allegiance? That, that shield is pretty cool. That art is sweet, by the way. Yeah. Have you seen that? Have you seen the flavor text? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, this set is sweet. So, I want to start concluding uh, today's podcast. There's a few things I want to mention at the end. First off, ignoring the typical YouTube drop a comment, smash that motherfucking like button garbage. I actually want people to comment with topics that they are interested in us covering in a casual and competitive mindset podcast. I pulled the Facebook group that I moderate, the Competitive EDH Facebook group, like a week or two ago to try and get some more topics. I have a whole list. I've probably got, a, I don't know, enough for months worth of content, but I would love to hear from you guys what topics you are interested in having discussed from a dual power level perspective because I can't think of everything myself. Will clearly can't think of anything himself. And the Facebook group is like four times smaller than the subscriber count of the Lab Maniacs channel. Yeah. So bigger audience, more suggestions, more input. And I value input. I would also like to leave an open invitation to everyone listening that Will and I have played in a lot of playgroups over the years, both casual and and competitive, and pretty much everywhere along that spectrum, from real agree. pre-con yeah. casual to actually competitive. It is not the easiest thing to balance a playgroup where people prefer different styles of gameplay. And I know that some people have done articles on how you do that, but I wanted to leave an open invitation to anyone listening that if you are having difficulty managing a playgroup where there are mismatched power level preferences or anything along those lines, feel free to email us, leave a comment, just get in contact with us on any platform you feel like and talk to us about it. And we are happy to provide input, talk about it as a case study in an entire episode so that other people can benefit from it. Anything that we can do to help you find harmony in your playgroup. Because at the end of the day, EDH is a social format. We play it to have fun. And if you're not having fun in your playgroup, then something is going wrong. Finally, as is going to be our concluding topic, Will, would you like to leave a comment without context for us to sign off on? Raptor Allegiance is super sweet. I think the Salamander one blue flyer is the best card in the set. You can leave in the comments if you think I'm wrong, but you can fight me on it. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> that has been Will. <laughs> I have been Dan, and we will see you next time on episode two of the Dual Nature Podcast. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening.